Hi. Uh, so this week and the next one, we will try to get the colors right in our pixels through an algorithm called ray tracing. Uh, and that is the main topic waiting us. Uh, so let's get to there with our slides here. Uh, so I am Yusuf Sahilolu, your instructor, and these slides are from O's, Akis. Uh, so we will go through them. Okay, ray tracing <clears throat> is the uh, action of getting realistic images in our image planes. So it consists of several components. Uh, let's go through them one by one. Camera, obviously, so that would be our eye. Uh, and that is my cat in the background, by the way, making a good jump, okay. Uh, so yes, camera is that. Uh, eye location, so this is uh, the place where from where we observe the scene. And the camera has this image plane. We treat this as a separate component, uh, but actually they are together. Image plane, you can just map it to the uh, camera uh, coordinate system, one of the uh, uh, coordinate system planes, but we also sometimes push it further, like uh, shift it. Uh, so the main task here is uh, the main definition of the image plane is uh, the place, the array of pixels, raster of um, pixels uh, on which our colors will be mapped. And to do that, we need a scene, obviously, which is on the same uh, coordinate space, coordinate system as the camera, as well as the image plane. So everything is compatible here. Uh, and to these objects, in this case, I see only one object, but there may be multiple ones. I uh, I use them. Uh, basically, my task is to get their realistic projections on this image plane. And to increase realism, uh, I need light, uh, without which nothing can be seen. So uh, lights are there with their important locations, etc. And a lot of rays. So that is the idea of ray tracing, as the name implies. Rays are shot from camera towards the scene, and the hit points are very important. We combine them with the normal of the uh, hit location as well as with the location of the light to get uh, colors. Actually, the way we compute colors, I will cover them next week. This week is all about generation of these rays and the intersection tests. Okay, so now let's get details on these components. Camera uh, has a location as well as an orientation. E stands for I, so that would be the location of the camera where we put it, and it comes with this up vector, the upside of the camera, which we refer to as V. And uh, to define a good uh, basis, a good coordinate system, we want these uh, three axes to be perpendicular to each other. So let's do that. U would be our perpendicular component to V, and W is a perpendicular to both U and V. And typically, we put E to the origin. So E is the origin of our camera space, 0, 0, 0. And the three axes are defined using our usual Cartesian uh, system, one zero zero being U, or we uh, mostly know this as X and this as Y and this as Z, but here we stick with U, V, W uh, for reasons that will be clear later. Okay, and V is zero one zero, etc. So V is the up vector. 0, 1, 0. And W is the opposite of gaze vector. So gaze means look at direction, looking at direction. So this picture is better for that sense. So uh, I am looking at this direction. So it will be the negative of W, right? 
so W is this direction and uh, negative uh, of W would be my looking at direction. Uh, and uh, U would be perpendicular to these uh, two uh, axes. Uh, and we get that using cross products, a very fundamental tool in computer graphics. Essentially, to get this, you we use this right hand rule where you align your fingers of right hand with V, and then we bend them towards W. Then, wherever your thumb points would be the result of V cross W, which is U in this case. So, if you bend it from here to here, that would be your thumb. Okay, so image plane uh, is. Uh, can be on that UV plane directly. In this case, distance would be zero, but we generally put a distance uh, between the eye location and the image plane uh, to simulate perspective projection. Uh, so, okay, distance belongs to image plane. Uh, and we also need resolution of this plane, like 800 by 600 or something like that. Uh, we need pixels. These are this is pixel zero zero, and this is the last pixel, like the matrix notation. Uh, and we also need four uh, real numbers for the left, right, top, and bottom. As you can see, left is in the negative side, whereas right is in the positive side. This is the typical configuration. You can change this, but in the assignment, we will also stick with this. Uh, uh, stick with this configuration. Similarly, um, top would be positive and bottom would be negative. And here we have a different view uh, where we show the negativity of L and B. Uh, and also I show additional rays, like in this example, I show six rays. Uh, and yeah, objects, other components, obviously we need some digital objects in our view volume that is in the camera coordinates uh, space. So like they can be anything, but uh, the, the way we design them is we use a set of polygons, like triangle would be the most popular polygon for that. And we stitch them together. Uh, getting this so-called mesh. But sometimes your objects are just mathematically valid, definable surfaces like sphere, then you can, you don't even uh, need to uh, explicitly put, uh, put triangles around. So you can just use some implicit functions to get this in your scene. And objects also come with materials, so not just positions, materials like are they mirror-like, hence are they reflective or no, or are they transparent? So this guy is a little bit transparent, we call it semi-transparent, sees through. And so these are all materials. And these effects can be easily reflection here in see shadows. These effects can be obtained easily with ray tracing, as we will see later. Lights are also super important. We have ambient lines, lights. Uh, so these are the lights uh, that are coming from everywhere. And it makes sense because when you have a light source, you don't just see the hit point of that light vector because it scatters from that location to all other places. So there are ma many light vectors around and we, can simulate it using ambient lights. And additionally, we need a light with a source. So that would be our source location. And we, uh, we have this positional lights for that, which have also directions. Rays, the last but not the least uh, component in our system uh, is ray. It is a half line. I So it align can be infinitely long, uh, but in our case here, we 
want a start point for this line, which is the origin. And then we go in forward direction using positive T parameter and the D would be your direction. Hence, we call this a half line. Normally, you don't put, uh, uh, so you, you uh, actually we need some kind of origin, but normally T can be uh, any real number. In that case, you have a full line. But again, we will stick with half lines here. Uh, okay, so as you change T, which is parameter, this is the parametric representation of a line where I have only one parameter because one line is a 1D object. Uh, yeah, so with that, I can go over this line. And by going over that line, I will find intersection points as we will see later. So the algorithm, is uh, uh, very simple to describe actually. You have just four lines of pseudocode here. Obviously each line will be expanded, but it is very easy to understand the algorithms for each pixel in your image plane. You compute a ray through that pixel. And then that ray will be intersected with seen objects if it does. Uh, then I will save the hit location as well as the normal at that hit location. And then in the last step, I will set the color. I will do shading to compute the pixel color uh, using that ray and that hit point and that normal N as well as the light, which is a global thing. It doesn't depend on this for loop. So today, this, this week, actually, we will cover these two steps. And next week, I will deal with the color computation. So it would be better to see the stuff on an example. So here, my task is to find the ray passing through this particular pixel. So which, what is this pixel? This is zero, zero, remember? So uh, its row would be zero, one, two, and column would be zero, one, two, three. Okay, so it is, two, three, pixel, two, three uh, indices of this pixel is that. So what would be the ray? Let's compute this. And please pay attention here because computation of this ray is uh, fundamental. Uh, it is, uh, uh, so without that, you can't do any kind of ray tracing. M, so I will start with the center pixel, okay? And there's a reason for that. Uh, so let's first go to the center. How can you go there? I can go there by just inverting my direction, W, getting this gaze vector, and go distance amount, because this is the distance from image plane to my um, origin. Yeah, so it will land me to M, which is a 3D positional vector. Okay, so there is no index here. I don't care about the uh, integer index coordinates, index, indices of this pixel. I just want to learn what 3D position this pixel corresponds to in my image plane. Yeah, so I will get the 3D vector. So this is a three by one column vector. And using that, I will get another 3D positional vector, which would be called Q and it is corner, corner for Q. And to go, go there, I need to go left. So from M, I will go to the leftmost point uh, and I will go in this direction because U is like my X direction. Uh, so my left and right direction. And remember L is a negative value, hence you will go in the opposite direction uh, with the amount L, which will land you here. So now I am here and from here I need to go up. So to, the, to that effect, I will use my up vector V and I will use it T amount, top amount. So where is my top? It is predefined. Now that I have Q in my hand, I am ready to compute the 3D location of this uh, IJ, pixel IJ, which I call S, okay? So S is another three by one vector, positional vector. And to go there, actually to go any other IJ, 
uh, pixel from now on i will use the same tactic i will use my predefined queue and i will uh, use my u and v axis directions using some offset and this is my test to compute these offsets now su and sv what are they uh, so we can compute that as follows uh, so first of all don't pay attention to this parenthesis term so what is r minus l it is the width of my image plane right so if l is minus one r is one then i have a width of two and i divide it by the resolution like i have 800 pixels so this term this term is then give me the length of one pixel so i will go i many of them because i is the query index but there is also this little 0 0.5 uh, so i also need to go further because i many of those jumps will lend me to this bar to this line but i represent the pixel pixel is a square by the way right uh, in this representation and i represent the pixel using the center of it so to do that i need to go 0 0.5 further okay so all these 0 0.5s will be accumulated by this length term hence you will land exactly in this uh, green location and you will do the same similarly from top to bottom uh, using the height instead of uh, width and using the vertical resolution ny which would be 600 if this is an 800 by 600 image uh, okay and finally this is the main task anyway and this is the easiest step actually so after dealing with su and sv which is the most uh, challenging step the computation of ray, ray is piece of cake you just create this vector from e to s which would be s minus e and starting from e i go in this direction by the way i call this d for simplicity i go in d direction t amount that t has nothing to do with the top by the way it's an unfortunate coincidence this is our parameter of line so let's wrap up what information have i used to get this uh, equation, I used E, the eye location, camera location. I used distance in the computation of M. And from M, I went to Q point. And to, to do that, I have used uh, UV, the vectors. And, and once I am there, I have calculated my SU, SV using image width and height as well as the uh, uh, using image resolution as well as the widths and heights so i have used all these parameters that are all defined in the uvw space the camera space so this example is important uh, both for your exam as well as your assignment so i will probably ask uh, for a computation like this in the exam as well uh, but uh, in the programming assignment this is definitely coming so uh, so let's go through an example to uh, keep everything uh, good on your side so here the task is the computation of ray passing through this particular pixel in this 1024 by 768 image where i have typical uh, LR, TB, uh, and distance, and also a typical I, which is origin, and I also have typical UV uh, directions that define my camera space. So that will be the output. Okay, uh, so it you can even extract something from this, but obviously you have to complete this. So we will see how to get here because this is easy, right? The rt is origin which is e plus t parameter t times a direction which is 
your ray direction. So this is your test to fill in this part actually. And then we can talk about it further, but let's fill that in. And I need, I have done this on Blackboard so far. So to do this here, uh, we may be needing some uh, access to keyboard at least. Uh, and I will also have access to this part. You can drive this, obviously, just we have derived before, but for the sake of time here, I will just use equations we have derived, we have derived. So M would be what? Uh, what is the center? What is the location of the center pixel in 3D in UVW space? That is my starting point. That would be E plus minus w because distance is one in my example so in other words m would be let's try this experiment m would be uh, what zero zero minus one by the way w is zero zero one right so it will be the cross product of u and v which is uh, which is a simple thing to compute, but you have to memorize something. Uh, but for this special case, zeros and ones, they cancel each other and the cross product of these two just be gives you zero, zero, one. And for M, I need the negative of it, as we have seen here, since E is zero, negative of it. Now let's go to Q. To do that, I will add, uh, so Q is, and by the way, L is minus one. So I will use minus one, zero, zero. And so minus one will be added with this guy. Uh, as well as with this guy, but there is no X component here. So I don't care. Uh, so that is it actually for the first component minus one. And for the next component, I am looking at, uh, so the second com middle component of U is zero. I will get zero effect. Here from V, I will get one and one times right, which is one. And I add this to this zero, giving me another one. And for the last component, I will use uh, the last component of M is minus one. So minus one plus last component of U is zero, zero times something zero. And last component of U is zero, zero times something zero. So it is zero. It is just that. So that would be my Q. And I am now ready kind of ready to compute this S. And to go there, I will use Q, okay. Uh, but I also need some SU. Uh, okay, so that SU, what would that look like? So what is SU? Let's, uh, let's uh, uh, talk about that. The, Width will be R minus L, which will be two, right? Two times, two times something. What, what is I? I is given, right? The index is 256 plus 0 0.5 coming for my offset over NX, which would be 1024. So that is my SU. And for SV, <clears throat> I will have the height, which is one minus minus one, two, two times. <clears throat> uh, what would be my index here? 192 given plus the offset over, I go over the vertical dimension, which is 768. Okay, so now I can scale my uh, U and V 
with these SU and SV, negative of SV actually. So let's do that. What would, so let's write this part, SU times U, what is that? Uh, so I will go to the column vector representation here so, because now it will be too complicated. So U, I will scale it with this monster. Okay, so that will be the first component of U, second component is zero, third is zero. Okay, so similarly, I will scale V with this monster and the negative of this monster. Okay, so zero times whatever is zero. So this is one, so one times negative of this, negative of this. Uh, and the, re the remaining is, the remaining bit is zero as we have zero on the third component. Uh, okay, so these are my scaled uh, U and V uh, vectors, direction vectors. And I also need to add Q. Uh, I, need, I need to bring Q to this equation. And Q is this guy. So I, there is no place here. So maybe we can create a text field for us. Uh, I can put this here. Again, remember Q is minus one, one, minus one. Let's keep them close. So Q plus uh, scaled U plus scaled V. Okay, so that would give me my S actually. <clears throat> uh, and I need, so S point, and the direction from origin to S point is S itself because S minus E, where E is zero, zero. So it's nothing, it's, it's just S. So in other words, this sum is supposed to give this part. So let's verify that real quick. Actually, I can verify the last row immediately, minus one, because I have minus one plus zero plus zero, this is done. Okay, so what's going on in, at, in the top, at the top. Uh, so, do we see a connection? <clears throat> so, if we, where is this text field? So let's get rid of this too. Maybe it will be more clear that way. So I am talking about five, 12 plus one over this thing. Mm. And so what is happening here? So I have, if you look carefully, five, 12 over, uh, five, 12 over 1,024, which is 0 0.5 plus one over 1,024, which is something. So I have plus 0 0.5 from here, right? Five, 12 over this 1,024. So I have 0 0.5 plus minus one gives me minus 0 0.5. And I also have plus one over 1024, which gives this uh, output. So you don't have to, obviously in the code that will be done automatically, this output of this thing. But if I ask something like that in the exam, you can leave it at this understandable position. Okay, so similarly, you can also verify that this row gives me this thing. Okay, so that's it actually, as far as the ray uh, computation goes. Now I will also go through the uh, ray versus object intersection because once I have this ray, let's go full screen again, uh, I need some intersection computations. Yeah, so. This is just a reminder. 
like how to go from the origin in the direction of D. Uh, so as you double your T, you use two of these direction vectors, you are here, etc. So these are just a recap. So this is important. Uh, the ray is very long. So even if we will not consider the backwards of it, we will still be considering every possible point in the forward direction. And that direction, I am indeed only interested in the uh, intersections in this view volume. This is called the canonical view volume. We will see how to transform the model view coordinates, the defining object coordinates into this system. So don't worry about it. Currently assume every 3D object is in this view volume. And if array intersects something here, that is before the image plane, which is the yellow plane here, then it will give me a valid T value, but that would be less than T min. T min uh, is the starting of that ray at this yellow plane. And T max is the uh, location of that ray in this back plane. We call it far plane. So if it is less than the T value is less than the T min, then I don't care. And if it is bigger than T min, T max, then I don't care either because then that object is too far for me. So now let's talk about object representation surface. We have we are interested in the shell, the surface outside. So we can represent the surface of a object implicitly using a function. Uh, and if I plug the correct true surface points to this function, it returns me zero. Okay, in general, we use sine distance functions here, but um, to keep things simple here, I will just use mathematical functions. I, I will deal with basic objects like sphere or plane. <clears throat> uh, okay, so yeah, that is the implicit definition because there is no x, y, z in your hand. You just have this f in your hand. And when you plug the query x, y, z, if it returns zero, then you say that, yes, this is the x, y, z I am looking for. If it returns a negative value, it means that you are outside the surface. If it returns a positive value, it means that you are inside the surface. And this is called implicit because I can test whether a point is on the surface, but I can't really generate those points. <laughs> and so, uh, so I will now, instead of using three X, Y, Z coordinates, I just concatenate them into my position vector P and FP, uh, the P's, the positions P that gives me, give me zero are the positions I am interested in, which are the white locations in this example. By the way, we use implicit surfaces in medical imaging as well, a very cool application. Uh, in that case, the F function is defined in terms of intensities coming from your CT scan machine or MRI machine. Uh, but the idea is the same. Implicitly, all the organs are defined. And now, Coming to this equation, P, I can replace this P in terms of my ray, right? The ray I have computed in the first part. So I will just test this I location plus T movement on the direction V. And this direction is S minus E or E minus S, remember from our previous discussion. So let's intersect the ray with a plane, right? So it, it is a very fundamental step in uh, the business of intersections. A plane is defined implicitly with this equation. A, B, C, D are the plane constants. And when you plug the correct X, Y, Z, it returns zero if that X, Y, Z uh, is on the plane. So to define that, I need a point on the plane, which I call A, and I need the normal direction of this plane, which is a vector that is perpendicular to this plane. Then comes my dot product, which is the following. Uh, so if you take a point P 
x, y, z. So P is x, y, z. If you take a point on the plane, and if you consider this vector from A to P, and if you dot it with uh, the normal, so if P is on the plane, then this red vector must be perpendicular to uh, our normal vector N. And the way we get that perpendicular among uh, is the is to complete the projection of this vector on this vector. So if this vector is per, uh, perpendicular to this green vector, then its projection here would be zero, right? In this case, the projection is non-zero, like it's covering uh, stuff here. Okay, so in this case, that would be parallel. Uh, sorry, perpendicular, so I will get zero. And if I move this P along the surface, like here, or here, or here, whatever, everywhere, it will return you zero. But when you use a P, like that is sticking out of the screen, like somewhere here, then the projection of this on my N would be non-zero, right? Like it's, when I project it here, I will have a non-zero value. That's why it, it is not on the plane. So long story short, this is the equation with which I can define a plane implicitly. And okay, then what can I do? I can do the following. So that P, I can replace it using my ray that I have computed based on T parameter. So I am looking for T values that sets this equation to zero. And to do that, I can use identities on dot product like uh, it distributes inside a dot this vector is a dot this part of that vector plus a dot this part of this vector. And also that identity. So these are like works similar to our real number stuff. Uh, so with that, I can get this T, a scalar value. And now here I know this T min T max since I know my V volume. So if this T is less than T min or bigger than T max, then I don't consider, I don't care that hip location, I discard. I treat that like it has never intersected. Otherwise I will use that T, which, land, which lends me to the hit location using O plus that T times D. What if D dot N is zero, then I will get a divide by zero exception. It is T is undefined. So T doesn't exist at least a real value. So it shouldn't occur, right? Because plane is an infinite thing. So plane is huge. So, and a line, a, a vector will eventually intersect it. I don't care. It will take a big T max maybe, or a small T min, but it will. However, there is a tiny case where it doesn't intersect the plane. And that case is uh, the ray is parallel to the plane. So now it can go as far as it wants. Since it is parallel, it will stay parallel forever. So it will not be able to intersect the plane, giving you a, a non-applicable and non-integer uh, T. So let's also go to another example, the raised sphere intersection. So just as I have defined my plane using A, B, C, and D, now I will use C, X, C, Y, C, Z, and R. Again, four parameters uh, is enough to define a sphere. Uh, actually, yeah, so let, let's keep it that way currently. Uh, so C, X, C is the center with these three components. Uh, and intuitively, I am looking for points whose distance to this center is equal to R, right? So this is how we define a, a sphere. So the distance between position P and position C is what? So remember that length. So it is the square root of uh, the sum of squares. So to get rid of the square root, I just take the square here 
and then I need to take the square of the radius as well. So then this is the equation I end up with. That distance from P to C must be R if that P is on the sphere. And I can write that in a dot product form because remember dot product is by the way, so if I call this vector K and this vector, uh, that's, uh, uh, Z, very weird names, but whatever. I so these are three. Um, these, these are three dimensions, right? So key X, key Y. Let's go with two dimensions, okay? And Z X, Z Y. I have so that product of K K dot Z will give you. You will multiply these terms the corresponding terms component wise and add the multiplication of this guy. And you, you repeat this as many dimensions as you have. Then this corresponds to this equation directly. Okay, so now again, as I have done in my plane part, I replace P with the point given using my ray equation as I am in the ray tracing business. And so here you realize something, this dot product, so T will be multiplied by an, another T at some point, giving T square. And also T will be multiplied by some scalars. Also there will be terms without any T in them. So when you expand that, you will end up with this quadratic equation in T. And from high school, we know that quadratic equations have two solutions. And these two solutions are the two intersection points of my ray with my sphere, which is expected, right? So when you go in, you have to go out at some point as this is a uh, finite sphere and your line is infinite in this direction. Yeah, but sometimes your ray can be like this. This is not a ray, obviously, sorry, it's nonlinear. So let's try to, okay, I will not be able to draw it, but assume a ray from this location to this letter N maybe, that will not intersect this sphere, right? Then how can you detect that? There is this square root term. Inside square root, I have something called delta B square minus four AC. If this is negative, I can't take its square root without complex numbers. So I don't have a real number solution real valued solution. So if this D is negative, then there is no hit, quit. Otherwise, use that delta uh, with uh, plus and minus versions uh, to get your two plus and minus, uh, or minus and plus in this case, uh, uh, intersections. And there is also a case, remember this kind of equations like X squared, minus four is zero. Okay, so this is also square quadratic equation in X, right? But uh, yeah, and it has two solutions, minus two and two. So that is not the point I am trying to make. Uh, sometimes there is only one solution. Uh, so two roots are the same. And th that is the case when your line is tangent to your sphere, then you will have only one intersection point. So this is still good. I have an intersection, I can use that. But in general, this two case will happen. Yeah. Now comes the third intersection situation. And this is probably the most important because my objects in my scene will be a set of triangles. So I will boil down to computation of ray triangle intersection. Ray sphere is a very rare case, actually, if you have some sphere on your scene, uh, obviously you will use this, but maybe that ball or basketball, football, that is defined by a set of triangles, then you will not even use this either, but it gives an idea. And ray plane intersection is still super important because I will use that for the ray triangle intersection test as 
triangle is a subset of plane. So uh, let's come here now. Uh, what is happening? Yeah, some. Uh, so ray triangle intersection can be done implicitly using implicit equations or parametrically using parametric representation of triangle. Here I am talking about that. Uh, and parametric representation is achieved using uh, barycentric coordinates. We will come there in a minute. And this is parametric representation of a sphere, by the way, a very irrelevant part, but anyway, like, here I am showing you the idea of parameters. I need two parameters, one angle that moves me along the equator and second angle that moves me along this vertical direction, theta and phi. So with that and with the fixed radius, I can represent a sphere with two parameters. Similarly, I can represent a line with only one parameter, which is T. Uh, and I can represent a triangle using three parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, the barycentric coordinates. Uh, so I will do that for a different technique, but now let's stick with the implicit techniques, okay, as we are used to them already. So solve this problem using implicit tactics. And the idea is first intersect the ray with the plane of the triangle. Remember, plane is an infinite thing and triangle is just a subset of it, a closed triangular region on it, defined by ABC triangle vertices. Uh, so first I need the normal of the plane. In this case, I am only given the triangle, so there is no normal of the plane, but normal of the triangle is equal to the normal of the plane as they are on the same plane. And to go there, I will use this vector from B to C, and I dot it. Uh, I take a cross product of it with B to A. Remember the right hand rule: uh, make your hand in this direction from B to C, bend it towards B to A, then your thumb sticks out of the screen, which is what we want in this case. Okay, then. I, now that I know n, normal, and p is my query point, and a is any point on the plane, so let's pick this a as the name also looks like that. You could have picked c or b as well, obviously, or the center of these points, whatever. I picked the corner a. Yeah, then I will do my old plane ray intersection tactic, which gives me a t value at which this ray intersects that plane. So using that T value, I land to this location P. So is it inside this triangle or not? So to answer that, I draw lines from P to triangle vertices. So one, two, three, splitting this triangle into three effectively. If P is inside, then the sum of these angles, these three angles I have drawn, will be two pi, right? It is. Uh, seen already so you can even uh, let this sink by a different example like if p is here outside in the same plane as this triangle assume everything is in 2d now uh, now do the same tactic draw lines from corners to this square point p now let's look at those angles one angle second angle third angle. So do the sum, does the sum of these three angles uh, go to two pi? No. Do, do they make a circle if you just put them together like this or this? It, it, it is short, obviously. Yeah, so then it is outside. So this is one test and you are done. It is done. But the problem with that is I need to calculate these angles, theta, beta, blah, blah. And now I can do that using dot product. So I have this vector, let's call this K again for our weird naming. And let's call this vector Z again, this from P to A. So K dot Z dot product is equal to length of K times length of Z times cosine of theta, cosine of angle between them. 
So if these are unit vectors, then those lengths are one. If not, you can make them units, it doesn't matter. Then you can get this theta by some arcos action, right? So it, we have some trigonometry involved and these terms, even if you approximate them, you run a summation in the background. So it is costly. That's why uh, if you go with implicit methods, I would recommend this alternative where the idea is very cool, actually. I will test whether P is inside or not, right? And this is my plane. So here is the observation. The vector from A to B, I call it this, and take the vector from A to P, let's call it this. Um, so let's get the cross product it will stick out of the screen, right? It will point out of the screen. Remember the right-hand rule, A to B, bend it towards that vector, A to P. So your thumb hits your nose or eye. <clears throat> okay, so what you may ask. Then uh, the observation is the following. Uh, if you take a reference point like C, which is a special point. It is the third unused vertex of my triangle, query triangle. Now consider this direction, this cross product from AB, same vector, and consider AC, okay? So what, what would that cross product look like? It will go inside the screen, right? Into the screen, if you, your AB and you bend it towards AC, it will be inside. And actually, whatever point you pick, if it is inside this triangle, it will gain the same direction, give the same direction as this uh, fixed reference cross product with respect to this AB, this edge. So you have to repeat this for all other edges as well, but this idea is the same. So you have to go for the similar same directions. Then you will end up with the inside outside test without dealing with any kind of trigonometry, any angles. But I have an even faster and more popular, more in use method for this test. Then I need to go from implicit to parametric representation. And to, uh, to do that, I have to talk about barycentric coordinates, which are the three parameters defining this given triangle. So what is that? Any point in this triangle can be defined using alpha of one point, alpha times of A, and beta of another point, and gamma of another, the third point. So I will take a blend of these three ABC points using alpha, beta, gamma respectively. And those alpha, beta, gamma are related to the closeness of query P to that particular point A, for instance. And it would be this, this area, little area, looked by A over the fixed whole area. So let's consider this. If I move this P like somewhere here, then again, the rule is draw lines to the existing fixed triangle vertices, and it will come here. So the area here, AA, will shrink. Meanwhile, this is fixed because the total area, I, I cannot update it. So the weight of A will decrease, which makes sense because now this new point P is farther away from A compared to the original P location. And actually in the extreme case, when you put it here, then this area goes to zero, right? And then zero over A is zero, alpha goes away. So you end up with an interpolation between B and C. That will be a linear interpolation on this edge, okay? Uh, yeah, yes. And so there are also additional constraints, be careful with them. So these three, coordinates, barycentric coordinates, they must add to one. If the P is on the same plane as this triangle, okay? 
And if I further want P to be inside this triangle, then I need to guarantee that these uh, terms are uh, positive. Obviously less than one, otherwise this will fail. So I want positive barycentric coordinates. And that is the test I will do. I will compute the barycentrics and I will test their sign. Uh, and also I will test this since I want it to be on the same plane. Yeah, so we have discussed these cases. Maybe I haven't discussed this. What if A and B are zero, beta, alpha and beta are zero? In this example, no alpha, no beta means that your point is exactly on C. Then zero, zero, so P is equal to C because P lands on C. Okay, it all comes from this area ratio. Uh, definition. By the way, triangle is a 2D entity, right? I can represent any, I should be able to represent any points by going in this direction and then this direction like that. So two parameters is enough because I have defined all the sphere with two parameters. So why can't I do it for this? Actually I can because alpha plus beta plus gamma is one. So you can get rid of alpha and put this guy instead of alpha and rewrite this equation this equation what happens is i have one minus beta minus gamma hitting a so one a then minus beta a and minus gamma a so here is minus beta a here is minus gamma a and obviously the others follow like beta b, b and gamma c yeah, so that is the technique. I have only two parameters to keep things more efficient. And in the end, I will look at these three. No alpha in my life anymore. So this thing must be less than one, right? Uh, otherwise, if this is bigger than one, then I have a negative alpha. And again, nothing can be negative. So this must be less than one. This guarantees that a point on the same plane on the same plane and then i also need positive values for the coordinates and again alpha is i got rid of it so i have left with two coordinates two barycentric coordinates and they must be positive otherwise point can be on the plane but can be at a very irrelevant location on of this plane uh, with respect to your triangle. So this guarantees that P uh, is on the uh, planes triangle, plane dot uh, triangle, query triangle. So let's call it QT, QT, query triangle. Okay, now that's it actually. Uh, I have some updates like for P, again, now let's go to my ray tracing, obviously. P is represented using uh, this equation, origin of the ray plus direction of the ray plus T. And that should satisfy this equation with these constraints on. Which means, the, which means what? So if I expand this, remember these are all three-dimensional entities, column vectors. So I have X, Y, Z components of everything, like of A's, B's, C's, of O directions. And the other guys are just the colors that I am looking for, actually. And I can solve this equation, because if you notice, I have three unknowns and three equations. And from basic linear algebra, we know that we can solve this kind of equations using Kramer's rule. Uh, so it efficiently solves that, giving me T, the interesting T point, and beta and gamma. First of all, so this has nothing to do with barycentric coordinates, that T must be inside my V volume. Okay, so this is about V volume. Then if that checks out, then the intersection point P is on the plane as the triangle PL. And if that also checks out, I also do these two, which guarantees that P is 
on the uh, query triangle of that plane. So PL dot uh, query triangle Qt, as we mentioned. Okay. Yeah, so this is a super important test. Again, let's wrap this up um, because it happens all the time as I have many triangles on my scene. Uh, and we have seen parametric and implicit methods for that. Here are some examples showing many triangles. Like in this case, I have about 1 million triangles. Here I have 9 million, here five and a half million, here seven and a half million. And here, this is even more scary, like 116 millions, million of triangles. So let's make a quick analysis. Assume that I was, I am rendering that bunny in the very first slide, which has like about 1 million triangles. And I need to send this many rays if I have this image resolution, which is a very normal resolution these days. So I have to send this many rays. I didn't use this value to put everything in terms of uh, thousands to get to see all these zeros. Okay, so this is about one trillion. So I need to send, I need to perform one trillion tests. Okay. And even if I do it with the cool parametric method, it will take some time. Uh, but we will next week see some acceleration structures. Uh, so some so rays will be first intersected with bounding boxes, bounding boxes uh, like BVH technology, bounding volume hierarchy. If that ray doesn't intersect the box, then I skip all the triangles within that box. So I will, in the end, be testing uh, array with like five to 10 triangles on average, once I can build that structure correctly. Uh, yeah, so that is the topic of next week. Yeah. But uh, it is not going to be also a very super solution because consider dynamic scenes, for instance, then you have to update the structure dynamically. So the ray tracing is costly to be, uh, to summarize. Uh, and in a scene where I have multiple objects, I will have multiple intersections naturally. Uh, and assuming none of these are transparent, then I have to take the first intersection. And I can do that using the minimum of all the hit point t's, uh, all the hit points given by different t's. So minimum, because I ob obviously go in the forward direction after the origin, i or o. That's why I will always go for the minimum t. And that is the end, actually. I put additional slides of my own here, uh, like to let you practice more like ray sphere we have done it so why not ray versus cylinder right we can also represent this parametrically uh, also ray box why not because box is a set of planes six planes to be exact yeah okay so you can go over those uh, derivations i recommend that by the way uh, and that's the end, uh, as I have now the intersection point with the computed ray, now the rest is about calculating the color at that point using light and surface normal. And that will be the next, next lecture, next week. Yeah, so it is the end of this lecture. I also put additional cross product and dot product applications in graphics like popular ones, distance between two lines. So I, I recommend you to go over them as well in your free time. Distance between a point and the line. So these kind of queries, they don't immediately occur in ray tracing, but they happen in lots of other places. So I recommend you 
to see them as well. Okay, so that is all I have to say about this topic. Uh, and I will see you next week with the uh, colors. Okay, bye.